we mentioned earlier that carbon can form double bonds and triple bonds with other carbons. And that brings us to the next category of unsaturated hydrocarbon, those containing one or more triple bonds. So in this case, unsaturated means not filled with single bonds, and instead, one or more of those single bonds is replaced by a triple bond. There are three shared pair in a triple bond, giving six electrons total shared between the two carbons. So we look down below at our three carbon hydrocarbon with one, two, three total bonds between these two carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six electrons shared between these two carbons that participate in the triple bond. You'll also see the triple bond represented with just the two dots in series. More accurately, to represent those three shared pairs, they should actually appear as dot, 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 with the, between the two neighboring carbons. Moving on now, it's time to focus on the properties of organic compounds. In addition to the flashcards that you've done for vocab, um, I regret to inform you, you will not find these properties on your reference tables. So it might not be a bad idea, hint, hint, to bust out your iPod or your iPhone and or your actual flashcards and make up five more with these properties. Bonding, solubility in water, conductivity, melting and boiling point, and reactivity rate. There's a one or two always rules. Most of these are usually or generally rules, and we'll start with an always. Since organic compounds contain all non-metals. They are always going to be covalent or molecular. There's no exception to this rule. So this should be one of the ones that sets in the easiest. It's carbon and hydrogen, uh, and they're combined with any number of other non-metals. Since everything in these compounds is a non-metal, that makes them all covalent or molecular compounds. Based on that, most covalent compounds tend to be insoluble in water because there's a tendency for a lot of covalent compounds, especially the organics, when we talk about hydrocarbons. Right? This is mostly for the hydrocarbons, and there are a lot of them. So if you're talking about a hydrocarbon, that's a very nonpolar organic compound. Does that mean that all of the organic compounds are nonpolar? No. All of the ones that contain functional groups do have a degree of polarity. So to varying degrees, they'll dissolve in water. Because remember this concept that we learned in Unit 7, solubility and solutions like dissolves like. Water is polar, and water is inorganic. So you need to hit at least one of those to dissolve in water. If water is polar and inorganic, then the organic compounds that are going to dissolve in water better at least be polar. So if you have something nonpolar and organic, it's not going to dissolve and water, which is polar and inorganic, because of the fact that like dissolves like. So the more polar it is, the more it will dissolve in water. Conductivity. Most of these guys are non-conductors. In fact, all but, this is an only, only the organic acids ionize. They're the only ones that conduct in solution. So I've shown you vinegar. Vinegar, uh, 
in the uh, electrolyte demonstration with the light bulb. Vinegar makes the light bulb go on because vinegar contains acetic acid, which is a poor conductor. Even though it's a poor conductor, it's still a conductor. So the light bulb goes on when we put the two electrodes in the vinegar. The acetic acid does ionize at least a little bit. That makes the organic acids the only uh, classification of organic compound that has a tendency to be a conductor, again, in solution. So organic acids will conduct. All the rest don't conduct. So organic acids are the only electrolytes. They fall into the category of acid, base, or salt. They're acids. So melting point, boiling point. Uh, they're covalent. All these substances are covalent, which means they have weak IMFs, which leads to low melting point, boiling point. Reactivity rate. This is a rate question. Speed. They react slowly. Why? Well, we said ionic compounds react quickly. You put them in water. If they're soluble, they dissolve. It's bang, bang, right away. Takes no time at all. Precipitation reaction. We see right away. Uh, that's because there aren't a lot of bonds. But in covalent molecules, especially organic ones, they tend to have a relatively high number of bonds, which means more steps. More steps means a slower reaction. Last up on our list of things to do on this page is to talk about the types of chemical formulas, of which there are three. We have molecular, structural, and condensed. Start off with molecular. This is the least bulky of all the formulas. And so for that reason, it's also kind of the least informative. Right? That's your negative. This is your positive. If you're doing, uh, making a list of pros and cons. If you've got to write a long journal, you've got to get a lot of information in quickly, and all people need to know is the ratio of elements, well, this is either the number or ratio. You got that taken care of right here. The ratio of atoms of each element that you have in a molecular formula, but that's really all you have. You don't know there could be different versions of this, this compound. In this case, there aren't, uh, but we'll learn about isomers later. Uh, the molecular formula tells, tells you nothing about what the molecule looks like. It only gives you the ratio of atoms of each element. Okay, an example of a molecular formula right here, C3H8. We have three carbons uh, per eight hydrogens, or eight hydrogens for every three carbons. Next up, we have structural formula. And this is sort of a tweener. It's somewhere in between molecular and condensed. It's the next step up in terms of bulkiness and amount of information. This one shows you the number or ratio of atoms, which molecular did, and at least slightly the arrangement. Oops, I'm sorry, I give you structural, not condensed. So we're going to most bulky. Okay, this is the bulkiest. I'm going to look at my terms. This is the bulkiest, which is a negative. We do condensed next. Smart. Uh, the most informative, which is a positive. Now you see I have... One, two, three carbons. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hydrogens. So I still get the ratio of atoms, but I also know how these things are arranged. In the, in the case of propane, there's really only one way I can do it. But as the molecules get bigger and bigger, I can make branches. So the structural formula tells you everything you need to know about not only what's in the molecule, the ratio of atoms, but also the shape, the arrangement of the atoms in the molecule. Now we get to the tweener, and that's the condensed formula. This is sort of a combination between structural and molecular. The condensed formula isn't quite as bulky, but it still represents whether or not you have a straight chain, whether you have branches, and where they are. An example 
of a condensed formula you have down here, and I'll show you how it works. We treat everything like a subunit. So we look, the first subunit in this molecule, that's why I stuck with propane the whole time, is a CH3. Check. The next subunit is a CH2. Check. And the final subunit is another CH3. Check. So the condensed formula treats each carbon, uh, is representative of, of each carbon subunit. It just doesn't show everything above and, be, uh, above and below. Uh, you don't have all the dashed lines. So it kind of gives you the best of both worlds.